You're watching the Team Nerd Tech Show with your hosts, Tim Gillen and Ruthie Kierlin. Well, hello, fellow nerds. Tim Gillen here, Terrapin Networks, Traverse City, Michigan. And hey, thanks for joining us for this week's edition of the Team Nerd Tech Show. Weekly tech digest for small business owners and managers and peoples who are buried in a small business and dealing with technology all the time. And we talk about that. And we'll have some tech news, uh, a tech tip, and a tech gadget, and some interesting tech stuff, especially now. There's a lot going on in this glorious world we live in. So we'll keep moving forward, and we will welcome our co-host and producer this week and every week, Ruthie Kerwin, calling in from Queens, New York. Hello, Ruthie. Hey there, Tim. How are you this week? Good. Good, good. Glad to hear it. I'm very excited about this show. I think it's going to be a really interesting one. This is episode 56, if you're following along at home. Uh, for tech news, first, we're going to be talking about this cool article that you shared on our t uh, Team Nerd Tech Show Twitter, which is terrapin.tech, that's D-O-T-T-E-C-H, about how the Nigerian print scam of old is still scamming people and how this is still making the rounds, still scamming people out of their money. And I want to talk about the whole so social engineering aspect of that. For tech tip, we are getting... A <laughs> We're talking about COVID-19 and how pandemics like this or um, anything similar might change the way that we start to think about small business and how we go to our customers, go to our employees, having employees work from home, just the, the possible changes that might be coming along from this um, virus sweeping the world currently and what we can look out for and what to think about. And then for Tech Gadget, kind of keeping in tune with the uh, whole idea of employees and, and employees working from home and dealing with customers in a new way, we're going to be talking about two different video chats that we recommend and that we use called Zoom and then another one from uh, Intermedia, which is a company that we're partnered with that works with a video chat called any meeting. So we're going to kind of dissect those if you should look into them for your own small business, etc. So let's get to it. Welcome back to the Team Nerd Tech Show with your host, Tim Gillen. I am Ruthie Kirwan. So let's get in now to tech news, talking about this Nigerian print scam, which I can't believe is still knocking around here in 2020. But um, yeah, can you tell me a little bit about this PopSci article that you shared on our Twitters? Yeah, we shared it on the old Twitters, PopSci, Popular Science, the old Popular Science magazine, been around for 100 years. They got a good website, popsci.com, P-O-P-S-C-I.com. And they had an interesting thing here about the Nigerian print scam, which is still fooling people. And I can't what this is, that. I know it's really something. As a reminder, you get some. This is an old email scam from way back, and in, in our world, way back might be 15 years ago, but from way back, where you get some email and someone said, "Hello, I'm a Nigerian prince. I have a million dollars. It's held up. If you'll send me a thousand dollars, I can get into the country. And when I do, I'm going to share a bunch of money with you." And people actually would send money. Uh, oddly enough, that. The old days, they sent checks. Seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> Seemed like a good idea at the time. And shockingly enough, there was no Nigerian prince. No. It's hard to say not that Nigeria even has princes. So that's yeah. one of those things that kind of gets overlooked. But the point is, and what they're talking about here is this is still working. And uh, these things are not uncommon. That fire festival was kind of like this. It talks mm -hmm. about that. And Elizabeth Holmes with mm -hmm. the Theranos and all that kind of thing. Um, I suppose to some degree, Bernie Madoff, you're sometimes we hear what we like to hear. And yeah. so we fall for it because we think there's going to be a good payoff. And that's referred to as social engineering. If I can fake you into this because you want to believe it anyway. That's how that works. Um, we've heard stories of elderly people getting a phone call and it's just some kid going on, Grandpa, hi, it's me. I need some money. And yeah. sometimes they send some money thinking it was grandson Johnny and it was just some guy who just kind of guessed that it was an old person who might be answering and well they could be very believable that's the thing very the, 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 yeah. the hackers the, the bad actor side of it can be very believable in making yeah. you feel like oh my gosh this is an emergency I do need to send money right. whether right. it's to a fake grandson or a Nigerian prince or anything like that right. they they're, they they right. can be very believable they know what they're doing which is the scariest part of it really and the popular science article here talked a lot about the psychology of it. That's really where it was going. Uh, the interesting part of what, how our brains work to, I guess I'll use the phrase fall for this. 
And they, they talked about how it goes back into the last century. Well, two centuries going to the 19th century with uh, uh, stuff. Even, and even in the, even before that, where, where letters would be rotated around from someone who's being held hostage and ransomed by uh, pirates and so forth. And people would actually contribute. So this is a really old scam. It's a really old scam. And the, the concept of social engineering is an old scam. I was talking yeah. to someone once who said, you know, why does this happen? And I remember it was a person I was talking to was a, was a movie fan. And I've said, uh, you've seen the movie sting, right? I mean, so sting was an old caper movie from the back in the seventies, Paul Newman, Robert Redford, and uh, were a whole bunch of con men uh, conning people out of their money. And actually in the sting, they con the con man, they con the bad guys. So it's one of the things that makes it fun. But the point is con men, and they're not all men, but we'll call them men. Con men have been around kind of forever. And, and well, the female spy who's actually not a spy, all those things have been around forever. And the female woman who actually is a spy, uh, that's just all cons. And we, we, it's easy for us to fall for them. We're kind of wired to trust people. And when we see something come into our email or maybe a link pops up in something or other and we follow it, we think, well, my goodness, I want to do something about this. I'd like to help, which isn't a and bad thing. And maybe it'll help me in return. And maybe in, uh, now when you get to some of these, a lot of it's just based on greed because you're, you're not really doing it to help the Nigerian prince. You're thinking no. there's a payoff. Yeah, exactly. So greed begets greed. That's where it's more like the sting, uh, the movie, the sting. So, um, but this was an interesting thing. It's, it's, it's fun to read this because it talks about, about this notion of how we can get wrapped up into this and gives a couple of really good examples. And as a matter of fact, leading into what we're talking about now, it even brings up the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. We're going to be talking about that in a minute and how there's been a bunch of scams popping up about that too. And so we got to be careful because some of the stuff on those will be scams if they want your money. Uh, and if it's a site that's talking about getting your money, that's when you want to be careful. And this was just bringing up some ancient old scams and it's still going on. Well, it's it, was, crude, it, was yeah. a, it was a good article. I liked it a lot. It was, it was, yeah. it's, it was fun. It was also kind of eye opening to, to, to realize how long this has been going on and, and, and how it's kind of starting to evolve. You know, it, like you said, started with the, the pirates or, or older hostages in, in past centuries, and then Nigerian prince and snail mail and, and chain mails and all of that, and how now it's moved kind of into phishing and spoofing and, and that sort of more targeted attacks where it's not a numbers game as much. It's right. more people are, are, right. are being directly targeted. More targeted. That's a very good mm -hmm. point because a lot of the stuff was just numbers. They'd send out a whole yep. pile of them and figured somebody would and fall hope, for it. Yeah, exactly. And now a lot of the stuff is a lot more creative and a lot more uh, targeted where it makes you think this is coming from your CFO at your company yeah, or your banker who you normally deal with, uh, a name that you're familiar with. Um, one of the things we'll all hear sometimes people say, I never open email unless it's from someone I know. And that's a risk, of course, because yeah. it's really easy for me to pretend I'm someone you know. So don't let that be your, um, your thing. Well, if this is a link from someone I know, I'm going to think it's okay. It may not be from someone you know. To take that approach, add in, and I was expecting it. So if I get an email from someone I know and I was expecting it, that's fine. If it's an email from someone I know out of the blue and they want me to click on this link because I got to pay this invoice. Or download something or, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Those are appropriate to be at least skeptical of or suspicious of. Don't just think, well, I don't know how to keep it straight of it. Very easily just reach out and, and find out, is this legit or not? Mm -hmm. Especially if you, if you take a good look at it, sometimes you can tell there's a misspelling. The return address isn't actually what you expect. It might be a .ru or a .hk or all these different kinds of, of, um, of top-level domains, as we would call that. .ru would be Russia. .es is Estonia. You'll see these kind of things, and you know, hey, wait a second. This isn't .com like I'm used to dealing with with this person I normally get my email from. So those kind of things uh, can help you kind of be a trigger to be suspicious. Welcome back to the Team Nerd Tech Show with your host, Tim Gillen. I am Ruthie Kerwin. So let's move in now to our main topic of the show this week, our tech tip, which is kind of talking about, I've been wondering how I should actually phrase this more how we should start looking at business in the advent and, and now 
coming into hope, what's hopefully the wake of COVID-19, the coronavirus, moving into our communities and our economies and everything. Does that change how small businesses should be approaching the way that they interact with their customers and how they deal with their employees? Well, I think it's probably going to, actually. Yeah. And I don't it's think kind of that's, inevitable, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's inevitable. Right now, uh, as we're recording this, uh, the state of Michigan here where I'm uh, in, uh, northern Michigan, is shutting all sorts of stuff down. And, Same uh, in New York where I am. This virus is now just this week, the week that we're recording this. Uh, on March 11th, the World Health Organization called it a pandemic. That means it's on all continents. It went from a, from being endemic where it's kind of everywhere in a particular region to being an epidemic to where it's actually bad in a particular region and now has spread to being a pandemic to where it's actually around the globe as a real problem. And it's transmitted uh, surface uh, very easily. So you get on your hands, you rub your hands and your eyes, get on your hands because you grab a doorknob that somebody else touched four or five mm -hmm. hours ago or even a day ago that may have had it. So the, the uh, ability for it to spread socially or community spread as it's called when it first came into, let's say, the U.S. or Italy or any place else that it's had some problems with, it came with a direct link of somebody who traveled from China. And then we started getting what's called community spread, where people who hadn't traveled at all were now catching it, who had no direct relationship to this spot in China, let's say, or Hong Kong or, or anywhere, even any, anywhere in China. So that's changed the whole nature of it, of course, because now we're spreading it to each other and we've got nothing to do with some livestock market in China, in a particular province in China. So that's changed everything. And now what are we finding with a lot of companies are having their people work from home? And I think that's going to change for us for small business people in a lot of ways. So I work from home a lot. I'm recording this from a home office right now. I work from home a lot. Yep. Ricky works from, from home. my home office. Yep. yep. She's in her home office in New York City in Queens. I'm in my home office in in northern Michigan, in Traverse City, Michigan, and that's how we've always recorded this show. I work, my team works remotely a lot by design. We've been able to, the kind of small business tech support that we do, one of the things we've taken advantage of of technology over the years is that we can work remotely. So we have to go on site often to set things up. We can diagnose things remotely, but sometimes things have to be replaced uh, on site. Uh, we have to go on site to hook up cables and firewalls. But often that's a, we go on site for a few days or a, a bit, and then we can do most everything remotely. We're very used to working that way. A lot of my team works strictly remotely. And that's not uncommon now, and it's becoming more common. And you're going to find this, I think, as a small business owner, any of us are going to find that this is, it's just going to start coming into our conversation more. So oh, you might have a from home, you mean you where your staff would be would be the would have the ability to work remotely, whether working from home or from a variety of offices that okay. you might have around uh, your geographic location, in our case, say northern Michigan or or in your case, uh, the metro part of New York City. And uh, for example, we think about this uh, coronavirus, the covid nineteen, the city of New Rochelle, which is just north of New York City, mm -hmm. kind of had a put the whole city on quarantine. And the gentleman there who actually brought it back to New Rochelle took a train every day into New York City and into Grand Central Station. So that's a little nerve wracking. A little nerve wracking. Yeah. And then he walked to his office and walked back and that's what brought it back to New Rochelle. These are this can be transmitted very easily that way until we get a little more of a grip and probably a vaccine actually settled. And maybe we're gonna wait and see if how much of a seasonal component this has. This may die down as the weather warms up. We're not sure it's going to. It's been causing some trouble in parts of the world that are not cold. But we'll, we'll find out here. We're, again, recording this in the middle of March in uh, 2020. So by the time you listen to this, this may be more settled. Um, but the, the concept is the same. So when the big tech companies start telling their staff, we want you to work from home, is that going to trickle down to us in the small uh, in small companies, and I think it's going to. And what would that look like for a company that, say, makes cabinets? Like how, you know, if, you, well, if, you, if you're not a Google and you can't just yeah, send everybody to work with their computers, how does that look? Yeah, you're not going to be able to. Uh, you're, now, it might be different for your office staff. Yeah. And, and you may have office staff and sales staff and design staff who could come and go, who could work from home 
uh, and come into the office um, one week a month or one day a week so that you can have face-to-face -face meetings. But with the advent of some of the good um, video chat services and video streaming services, we use one here to make this show. Ruth and I gather with this show. We record this show uh, all through a, a, an online service. We have cameras and microphones that we use, and we can have a full meeting mm -hmm. where it's just this side of being face-to-face. -face. It really is. Yeah. Now, it's not the same, but it's pretty darn close. It's very close. Yeah, and nobody has to travel anywhere. And we're going to find that that's something that is going to start popping itself up. And as a small business owner, now, granted, you're, you're the staff out on your factory floor, if you're making cabinets or processing cherries or doing any number of things mm -hmm. that you don't maybe have that option, obviously, but you may have for your sales staff and you may have for your accounting staff and, and some of your business development staff and any number of things where they could work from home now. They may not be set up to work from home. Do you provide yeah, that for them for their question. home office? Right. What if they, you know, what if they live in cramped quarters or they've got other right. people who are back at their house all the time? What if they, you know, I'm, I'm a working parent and, and luckily my kids, when I'm working, they're out of the house. But what if that's not the case? If I have a nanny who's coming to take care of the kids. They're out of so the house only because they're school age. Yeah, right, exactly. right. And so... It's not going to be universal. We're a long way from that, nor, nor should it be. Now, maybe shared workspaces. We're up in northern Michigan in Traverse City, and a lot of people, we have a small actual physical city. A lot of people drive 20 miles back and forth yeah. to work. That's not uncommon, just on, on two-lane highways, and they're driving their cars. A lot of those people may want to work from home, and we may find as small business owners, if we want to get talent, we're going to have to be flexible with that. So we're with a lot having of somebody who has like the propensity to work at home yes, and the ability who's to set up for it and wants to and has shown a good ability to be able to work from home unsupervised or moderately supervised or daily meetings uh, or what have you. Uh, speaking as someone who's had a, a primarily remote staff for years now, it's not all that difficult once you put things in place. Mm -hmm. But I, I was able to because I'm working with uh, network engineers and technicians have an expectation that you're able to work remotely. And actually the people I was hiring were people who wanted to work remotely. That worked out fine. But as we've added staff over the years and we've got people who work remotely who are just a few miles away from us. So we, but we still have an office with a workbench area and people need to be able to come and go. I think most of us in small companies are going to find a mix of that. We, uh, a good friend of mine runs an accounting firm. Uh, they're also a customer. So we're, we're very involved with how they operate. Small accounting firm, they have seven or eight staff all together and do uh, several hundred individual tax and several dozen companies that they take care of. And they work, uh, they do a lot of remote meetings with their customers, with their clients. And then, but they also have people who prefer to come in and meet in the conference room. And that's appropriate. That's not, that's not strange at all. But he was telling me just the other day about a friend of his down in the Chicago area who's an, also an accountant who strictly works remotely. All of his staff works remotely. He provides them equipment, but his expectation when he hires a CPA or an accountant to work for him and his firm is that they have a place that they can work. That's part so of that's the deal. So that's interesting that you said that he provides them equipment. So it, it seems like he really, he looked at the situation. He found people who had the ability to work from home and then they, together they figured out the best situation that worked for his company and exactly. for them. So I think that that's something that a lot of small business owners can keep in mind that it, it you know, you can have this sort of back and forth to reach the right, right solution for, for you and your employees. Well, and think about it. If they were, if you were providing them a desk in the office, you're going to provide them with equipment. Of course. It's really, yeah. It's, yeah. It's really no different. Yeah. And, but you may end up even providing people with uh, furniture for their home. But then what happens when you separate from them? Do you get the desk back? Yeah. So that's stuff that you need to think about. Uh, yeah. The equipment, it's easy to say, I want that back. But also, then what do they have for security at home? They have some shared wireless they're using with the neighbor because they're being cheap and they don't tell oh, you that. Oh, very good point. Very good yeah. point. Yeah, so you need a way to have your tech team be able to verify, okay, that his or her connection at home is, is satisfactory. And We then, talked about a lot of this in, in, a, in a previous episode, just a few episodes ago, where when people are dealing with the life change, how to move from in-house in to remote, and the thing, right. all of the setups that you need to be aware of, and, and the things that we might not have... You know, it's not so easy as just opening up your laptop and connecting 
to your local Wi-Fi and then yeah. like dialing into your Gmail. Like it's not always that easy and it shouldn't be that easy, but that there are certain steps and things that you should be aware of. So I'm going to link up that episode here. Well, and think about it when you maybe hired into that accounting firm and they said, here's your desk. And there was a computer sitting there with a phone and somebody got you logged in and showed you how the email worked, whatever they were using there, just outlook with exchange behind it. And you didn't think much of it. Well, that's because they had that all built into the way they ran their physical location, the offices that they were working with. Mm -hmm. And a tech team like us, whether it's someone in-house or someone like us who they hired, who set all that up, that's not going to be any different if you're going to be able to have staff who wants to work from home. But you're going to, as the business owner, these, these questions will come up, which part of it's yours. And most of it's going to have to be yours if you want to have control. And if you want them to be able to work both in the office and at home, or if they want to work that way, what does that mean? Do you have a desktop at the office and they remote into that desktop? Who provides the computer that they remote in with? Or do you just have them work off a laptop that they take both places and you give them a docking station with a big monitor at the office? So I think so it comes down like, to, you know, looking at your budget um, looking at the outcomes that you're hoping for, yeah. looking at the people, the type of people that you want to have in your company, your company culture, that sort of thing. So, so there's, a, there's, there's a lot of different concepts and ideas, I think, that you have to be aware of before you make this sort of decision. That should be made with your tech team, yes. who is helping you get yeah. the rest the systems and processes and everything set up. Absolutely. Your tech manager needs to be part of this and to help you work through those conversations and because there's a lot of what ifs here that are all very easily answerable as we just described the way Ruth and I work. They're very easy to settle, but you just, it's also easy to overlook some key ones. And so you just do want to have some advice on it. Uh, it but it's very doable. And we're going to see it more and more as small business owners that the kind of staff we want to attract expects it. And that maybe certain issues like weather issues and or things like coronavirus may make sense to have that where you're set up to where people can work from kind of anywhere for certain types of roles. They can't build a cabinet from their home, but they can certainly help design the cabinet from their home office. So um, there's just several things to discuss, but it's very doable. And I think we're going to have a hard time uh, escaping it. So we might as well start to let that start percolating around in your head as a small business owner that this is going to be something we're going to see more and more. And it's actually extremely effective. It's a good thing for us in business. It's been very effective for my firm and for the people I work with who we've set this up with to be able to have a staff that can comfortably work from different locations. It saves a lot of driving time and people can work in a way that's more effective for them. And that's a good thing. Well, it saves you a lot of overhead, I would think, as well as a well, an owner. Well, it can. You still have overhead with it. The overhead doesn't go away, but it shifts a lot and can become more operational, not just capital. Welcome back to the Team Nerd Tech Show with your host, Tim Gillen. I am Ruthie Kerwin. So continuing on our conversation here about people working from home, I wanted to highlight two different video chats that we have used and that we recommend. So the first one is Zoom, which is actually yeah. what you and I are speaking on and recording this show on right now. Uh, moment, we're yeah. very comfortable with Zoom. And the other one is any meeting, which I am unfamiliar with, but you have recently been introduced to. So can yeah. you tell me a little bit about the differences between the two of them? And, and actually start off by telling me what any meeting and what Zoom really do as, a, as small business features. Yeah. And I'll step back actually and go, uh, because Teams does this, Slack mm -hmm. does this. Most any of the stuff that we use for real-time chat these days, which is a real common way to communicate in the office. 15 years ago, we all sent each other emails. Or you got we up were, and walked to the other cubicle. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, you wouldn't want to go actually talk to someone because that's like really old school. So you send an email, right? And uh, so now we tend to use chat, which is actually very effective. And you use things like Slack and Teams, Microsoft Teams, uh, Zoho Click, um, mm -hmm. uh, and Zoom US also does this. Or Zoom also does this. And the website is zoom.us. That's why I say that. But Zoom is particularly good at when you're doing video stuff. Whether it's video meetings, video training, webinars, they are particularly good at that. They've done a really nice job of handling the technology for that. Now, if you have people who are working remotely, it's extremely appropriate. Mm -hmm. As well as they work great on mobile devices. So you can be on your phone. You can be on an iPad when you're out in the field. You can send a quick chat hey, would you email me that sales proposal that's out on the, on the server? I forgot to bring it. All those kind of things. 
and your assistant can quickly grab that and send that to you, uh, a, uh, a team member. It's great so, because anybody can use it. You can, uh, when we set up our interviews, we just email a link and people can log in via the browser and they pop into the same room that you and I are speaking in right yeah. now. And the three of yeah. us can record us, the three of us talking. Uh, alternately, I use it with, I have an, uh, an accountability group of a bunch of other women who are also working from home. And once a week we meet in Zoom, there's probably six of us all in the same room where we could see each other face to face. We can talk. It's just like we're having coffee together. Right. Or sometimes when we're working, one of us will pop into the same room and we'll work at the same time. It keeps you honest knowing that there's somebody, uh, the tiny little window of a video of somebody else working at the same time. So when you are <laughs> working at home, you it's just like when you're working in a cubicle and you could stay focused. I'm not going to waste my time going on Facebook or whatever when uh, somebody else is there. It just keep kind of keeps you more in a work mode. Um, so Zoom can make you feel like you're still in that sort of community aspect that you have in an office. So for the small business owners who are thinking, you know, I lose control when I have my staff working at home. And I, I don't know if people are, what they're getting done, what's actually being worked. I don't know if they had, a, be a, a, great if they had a lousy day productivity yeah. wise because they really ran into some trouble or because they got unfocused. And what Ruthie's describing there is one of the neat things about remote work that can really make sense because this kind of video conferencing, and we'll just use that phrase for it, mm -hmm. that this kind of video conferencing can, can have the virtual effect of bringing everyone in the same room, same building, same set of cubicles, same offices, up and down the hall. It really can do that. And that starts to, and so what we were saying in the previous segment about I, I, this is shifting we're going to see a certain shift or not completely. And then you shift that to people who might do a lot of design work and accounting who don't necessarily need to have a retail physical brick and mortar environment. Well, these kind of things are a great way. I, I have these video meetings with my team, with my engineers, and it gives me a great way to just connect and all of us put eyes on each other and realize, mm -hmm. okay, we're working here. Exactly. And, and that really helps. And that goes back to what Ruth was just saying out just a few minutes ago. So really valuable. Well, Tim, I think that's everything that we have here today. Unfortunately, we have to cut this short, but um, it's been fun hanging out with you on our video conferencing chat app. <laughs> okay. Let's get together again next week and solve the world's problems one tech issue at a time. Sound good? One tech issue at a time. I'll be there. <laughs> Thanks. All right. See you then.